Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 483. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast, a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. For more information or to check out other shows on the network, please go and visit evergreenpodcast.com. First, I'd also like to give a shout out and thanks for a five-star review on Apple Podcasts by Penny Power OBE. Moving on to this week's interview, it's with Ian McRae. Ian's a work psychologist and psychometrician, author of six books, including the recent award-winning Dark Social, Understanding the Darker Side of Work, Personality, and Social Media. In this discussion with Ian, we explore some of the core concepts in his book, how social media shapes behaviors, defining one's true self off and online, self-responsibility, the difference between management by surveillance, oversight, or for performance, and the trickiness of hybrid work. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com. And please, if you have a moment, consider to drop in your rating and review for the show. And don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show. Ian McRae, great to have you on our Zoom together. You and I uh, both met at the wonderful Business Book Awards 2022. You are the author of six books. Your last book, Dark Social, Understanding the Darker Side of Work, Personality, and Social Media, was a winner. Congrats for that. Ian, in your own words, how would you like to describe yourself? Um, I'm a psychologist, I'm a writer, and I'm especially recently very interested in digital technology and the psychology of what happens online. It seems like online is has been spreading fires and rendering many people crazy, uh, or at least <laughs> yes. depressed, unhappy, uh, argumentative. I mean, it feels like you're in the in the, the midst of the big vortex and cataclysmic potential disaster. How how do you see? the general picture of the internet I mean, and how it's affecting our psychology. Yeah, there's some of that. There definitely is that, and it gets amplified a lot. I actually don't think that's the majority of behavior or communication or what's going on online. I think there is a lot of really good, really productive, um, really ethical, really useful behavior that's going on. I think that's not always what gets the most publicity or gets the most attention, but there is a lot of really good stuff going on online. There's a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of people connecting. There's a lot of people connecting over shared interests or passions or work or productivity or getting things done that they probably never would have got done before because there was never the way for people with those kind of connections, but no physical proximity to meet each other. So I think it's not all bad. It's not all doom and gloom. There definitely is um, some things that go on online that are not productive, not ethical, not good. And we do need to understand those because those can sometimes be two sides of the same coin. So sometimes we see productive behaviors go off the rails. We see people who are trying to do good in their own perspective or their own perception of things who do things that are terrible. But I don't want to focus too much or completely on the bad side of it, because I think there's a lot of good stuff and good behavior that we can use to model how we're connecting with people online and in the real world and how we're working with other people. So I think we wanna focus on both and make sure we avoid the worst of it, but that we can understand how we can bring the best of ourselves online and bring that out in other people too. All right, so a few things to unpack there, but uh, I wanna start with mm. your title of your book, Dark Social. It does seem mm. to lead even, I don't know, with the bright red background <laughs> to start thinking on the dark side of things. Uh, talk to talk us through the decision to have that as the title. I'm sure that that was quite a discussion with your folks at Bloomsbury. Yeah, it was. And dark social has another meaning in marketing. And the meaning of dark social as a marketing term or as a social media term is everything that goes on in, on the internet that we can't really see. So dark as in not visible. So everything that is, you know, kind of indexed social media stuff that you can search on Google is not dark social, you know, 
posts on Twitter that you can see, posts on LinkedIn that you can see, anything that's publicly available is not dark. But then dark social and marketing is kind of that unconscious of the internet. It's the stuff that's going on. It's all of the connections and communications and things that are happening kind of behind the scenes. So I thought that was an interesting connection to make between the kind of almost the unconscious communication that's going on of the internet behind the scenes. It's not visible, you can't analyze it. And then the kind of dark side of psychology, which again, some of it is, you know, processes things, neural inspiring that you're not necessarily consciously aware of, but there are all sorts of things that are going on in the background. Um, so I thought that was also an interesting play on words because obviously when we say dark social, it's immediately drawn to thinking of the worst of it and everything bad that happens on social media. And there's a lot of stuff that is deserves a lot of criticism and that we need to look at. Um, but I think it's really interesting to look at that perspective of all of the stuff that's going on under the surface that we really don't fully understand yet, but we definitely should be looking at and trying to understand. Yeah, maybe from a marketing standpoint, people tend to maybe confuse the ideas of the dark web versus mm -hmm. dark social. And maybe your email to me on Gmail is protected from the outside, let's say, hopefully, calling <laughs> <laughs> um, what being what it is. But the dark web uh, tends to get a whole lot of negative press. And as far as your perspective is concerned, that tries to draw out the more positive elements, would you say that is reflection of either or and your age uh, and your having been in the web so much long or your most uh, so much more of your life compared to an old guy like me or is it just because of your outlook on life maybe does that reflection come from the fact that you have a positive outlook on life and on humanity I mean, you picked up on something there that is a very good point. I think I am quite optimistic and I do have a positive outlook on things and try and um, go towards that area. I think it's also age um, because I did grow up just more comfortable with all of this technology. I mean, I've you know been using email for almost as long as I can remember. Um, I remember, but it's not exclusively exclusively an age thing because I remember when I was about eight years old emailing my grandpa and you know he was 80 years old and he was this was fantastic new technology for him so exciting because he connect with people um, all around the world and family he hadn't spoken to for years so I don't want to exclusively say that it's only younger people who have any talent or natural ability with technology or capacity to learn um, but it's certainly an advantage if you grow up with it and you're kind, it's kind of embedded in your day-to-day -day communication in life so age-wise I think that's an advantage in learning how to navigate it um, and kind of develop with the technology that evolves. I'm not starting from scratch necessarily, um, but it is also outlook too. And I think it's a choice because I do deliberately make an effort with social media and online profiles and all of that to make sure that I'm following things, interacting with people, having conversations that are productive. And I deliberately do not follow, do not connect with stuff that I think is kind of counterproductive or toxic. Um, and I don't need to be seeing it on an online feed day to day, you know, minute by minute. Um, I also don't have social media apps on my phone, which is probably, um, I'm in a minority of people of my age who I don't get regular social media notifications. I prefer to have social media as something that I can log into and check on my own time when I have a reason or a purpose to do it but i don't want to be flooded with that content all the time because i have been before and i do notice that if i'm not getting it on my own schedule or kind of within what works for me and my work and my life it can be very detrimental and i think that's when a lot of people have problems with anxiety and stress related to you know social media or any digital communication when it's just constant and it's impossible to turn off and you're not filtering it out Oh, I 100% agree with the idea of getting rid of notifications. It's sort of their imposition on you and your time, because that's what they're trying to do is grab your attention. And the more it's sort of inflammatory or, you know, risque or, or dramatic anyway, yeah. there's this, I feel like there is this propulsion towards drama in, in our world that, and I think these are things that you talk about where, we, we're we're creating drama, whereas if we maybe just knew how to turn off notifications, we might have less invasions of drama into our lives. 
Yeah, and I think it's really important to take time and to pause in any sort of communication, especially when it's constant and online and ever present, um, and just decide what you want to be interacting with and choosing and thinking about really how you want to act with other people. Because I think our behavior is sometimes quite different when we're acting impulsively or responsively, or we have our first impression of how we should respond or react or fight or run away from something, you know, that kind of fight or flight response. It's not always the best way to make decisions. So having those pauses, having some space mentally, physically, socially, whatever, is really good instead of that constant communication. But I wonder if this is an issue that has been around for ages, like, because um, you write a lot about leadership and how to manage time and schedules and understanding yourself and communication along that. So is this something that people have always faced in the workplace, like how to manage like competition for your time and your attention and how to prioritize tasks and communications and groups? Is this, how new is this or how is it, is it just a manifestation of problems that have been around for a while? Well, I would argue that the, I mean, like you said at the beginning, there's this, there is something new uh, mm-hmm. and beneficial to this ability to connect. But especially for people of my age, my ilk, who are in big positions now running companies, they weren't actually trained to deal with the influx mm-hmm. of, of stuff. You know, it was back in my days, so I might get a, a nice envelope with a stamp on it and a handwritten mm-hmm. uh, address on the front and a handwritten letter. And then I would decide on Sunday afternoon, my letter writing time to write back. Mm-hmm. And, and so, I mean, I'm not going to put my cast myself as some sort of retrograde, but when you're now faced with not just emails, but WhatsApp notifications and all these other apps that if you're not on top of come in and invade you, you're not equipped to deal with them. And, and then on top of that, there's a speed with which, as opposed to, I mean, even a fax, of course, was quick, but the the rapidity with which things are happening, that time acceleration felt is this is a a leap step difference. And on top of all the other pressures, whereas before information was power, everybody has access to information. So it's no longer the interesting thing. And so you 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 now need to be more focused on the softer skills. And in soft skills, that means communication. And rapid fire communications where you're just saying like your your immediate emotions might come into bear. Well, you mm-hmm. how can you normally answer the the volume of fast messages that are coming through at a reasonable, rational rate? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's tough. And I think wherever you can put up ways to or put together ways to slow that down a bit is useful. And I mean, realistically, it's not always possible. Yeah. Um, but I think it's one of the things that I do is I have separate work only communication channels and sometimes separate work only accounts, even for you know instant messaging or things like that. So, you know, work is it constantly invading my time along with you know personal life constantly. So you're getting all of these different messages from all of these different sources and really try and prioritize what's urgent. So, you know, a few things can get through if they're urgent, but you're not trying to deal with everything at the same time. I mean, I struggle with that too constantly because it's figuring out that, you know, prioritizing what is urgent versus what's important and what is all yeah. of the above all the time. <laughs> I think that's something that a lot of people do struggle with. But I almost wonder if this is something that um, we should be learning, not just in kind of orientations for jobs, but in schools. Like time management now is so much more important than some of the other skills. And it's going to be for people's entire lifetime, right? Like you can find that information. And once you know how to navigate you know, search engines and research and databases yeah. and stuff, that's relatively easy to find the information. It used to take days or weeks in the library. Um, but then the skills to manage that time and manage the volume of information and focus on how to apply it is something that I think is going to be universally applicable, but isn't really taught anywhere. Yeah, I, I, it reminds me, while I was at university in the United States, I had the pleasure of listening to an economist guy called Lester Thoreau. And so there we were, 18 years old or 19, and he said, when you become executives, you will learn, you have to learn how to type. And, you know, we were still writing exams by hand at that time. Anyway, I took him to heart and I learned how to type. But like you say, we were not taught about time management. And something I think that you talk about a fair amount in your book is actually the need more to know who you are in order better to prioritize what's important to you. Because if you mm-hmm. don't do the work on who you are, then what are you prioritizing against? Yeah, exactly. And people will tell you over and over and over, especially 
actually at work what is important to you and what you should be working on and what your priorities should be and who you should be and who you know what create success in their mind. And a lot of people end up on that treadmill of other people telling them what success looks like for years or decades or sometimes an entire career. Most people at some time or another, all of a sudden come to a realization and go, oh, <laughs> what people have told me success looks like is not what it looks like for me. And I've wasted this time or this part of my career. Not always wasted because you learn things and in the process, you, you know, stuff happens, stuff comes up. But it is important to do that and to figure out exactly what you value for success in your life, um, in your career and in your personal life and understanding how those can both be different because sometimes you do bring different things and you wanna balance those different things with you know, different amounts of time and the relationships in different ways. And sometimes you wanna separate those relationships instead of combining everything into work or everything into your personal life or mixing it in because it's easy to do, especially when it's all in your phone all the time. Um, but yeah, that kind of self-awareness and understanding is so important because you're right in highlighting that is if you don't prioritize what you want for success or what you want in your life or where you wanna see yourself in 10 years um, or more or less, then you're never gonna be able to prioritize that because you'll just be um, kind of consuming everything that comes in with equal priority, which it shouldn't be done with equal priority. You need to be able to pick and choose because there's unlimited demands on your time, especially if you're good at what you do. <laughs> there's always going to be more work to do, but figuring out what the best work to do is, is a challenging one and it's important. Yeah, well, there's certainly a limit on our time. Yeah. So, um, Ian, a psychologist and a psycho metrician, psycho, I don't know how you psychometrician, say, yeah. psychometrician. <laughs> I'm thinking that means that you enjoy data. Question yeah. for you, as a psychologist, someone who has studied all these things, well, first of all, what school of psychology do you put yourself into? I, I've been asked that question a few times before, and I don't really affiliate myself with a particular school. I think there's really useful kind of information and theories from different schools, and I think we can integrate a lot of it. But I wouldn't say I'm a Freudian or I'm a behaviorist, or I think there's really useful perspectives and kind of behavioralistic perspectives, but those theories are oversimplifications, right? So, and I, I kind of vacillate sometimes. I go, okay, the unconscious is really <laughs> interesting right now. Okay, for this specific project of this way of thinking, let's just look at the behaviors and outcomes, which is sometimes useful in a workplace context versus, mm -hmm. um, you know, looking at kind of unconscious processes that go on or childhood development stuff, which might be really interesting for looking at a particular case. So I, I sorry to say, I don't have a particular school. <laughs> well, it's, it's only just to allow for us to understand how you view things, really. I think that's the interesting point. And what I take away mm -hmm. is that you enjoy looking at the different schools and techniques and tools uh, but i imagine that data is an important part of what you do yeah and measuring outcomes is a very important part of what i do and in the books i've written that's always something that i really focus on in the workplace is if we're talking about characteristics that predict success or we're looking at you know personality traits do we have a specific measure of what we mean by success or what we mean by potential? Because if we're saying X, Y, and Z leads to high potential, we really need to say, okay, this type of potential, this is the type of behavior we're looking at. And I think it's really important to be clear about that, especially when you're explaining what success means to other people. Because then you can say, instead of saying, you know, these are the traits that make everyone successful, we can't really say that, but we can say, this is what makes someone successful and effective in a leadership position that requires these things. So if we're looking at, you know, strategic thinking and be able, being able to manage ambiguity and lots of information, there's certain traits and abilities that predict that. Um, if we're looking at a really focused kind of operational type of leadership where you have to be really detail oriented, you have to be really focused, you have to be able to manage a lot of rules and guidelines and reduce ambiguity, that's a different type of success. Um, so I think my general philosophy is that writing and understanding ourselves or at work, we really have to focus on outcomes and really be clear about what kind of outcomes, what kind of success we're looking at or trying to measure. All right, so then the thousand dollar question again, what does success mean for Ian McRae? I, <laughs> I, I thoroughly enjoy learning about people and <laughs> about processes and how people work together. So uh, success is really to be continually learning new things um, and to be understanding other people and understanding kind of how 
people relate to their lives and their work. So there's a lot of different activities I do around that, um, whether it's writing and writing books to explain this stuff. And then it's usually a launching point to a whole bunch of questions I didn't even think about either because I couldn't answer them in the book and it needs another book or people have asked me that about the book. Um, so, I mean, for me, it's not really an end point. It's kind of about what you're becoming from the work you do. Makes sense. So, um... In your book, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, lots of, of interesting things. One of the things you talk about are group dynamics. Mm. And uh, what I was intuiting of it is, is the need to understand one another in order to better have a, a dynamic in the group. So talk us through some of these points. If you're working with a team, what would you say are the, the, the key leading points uh, about making that dynamic work if you're the team member or the leader of the team? I think the biggest thing is understanding to manage and understand people as individuals. So there's a lot of manuals that'll tell you, this is how you manage people. This is what people need to succeed. It can never be a one size fits all approach, especially if you've got a highly skilled team that has different roles. So you really need to, again, break down what does success mean in this role? What are the outcomes that make someone successful and understand the traits, the abilities, the skills that fit within that role? Because I think to understand you know, difference and diversity at work, we need to understand that you need a lot of different people doing different things and people need the autonomy and the respect and the control to be able to do their job well. So I think if you can approach work and teams like that and understanding that people might work in fundamentally different ways, they might communicate in different ways or rarely communicate at all in some cases, but knowing how that might work in their role with that job is really going to help to manage people effectively and to manage teams that might be you know, different or diverse or even dispersed over geographies or time zones or different places to understand that if you're hiring the right people and they can do the job well, then figure out what makes them good in that role and have respect for that. And I think if you can respect what people are doing, it makes it a lot easier to understand how they're approaching it. Hi, I'm Brendan Slocum. I'm going to tell you how music can save your life, what it can do for you and what it has done for me and my guests. It's such a universal language. You can go any place in the world. And I love that. Hey, if you got soul, you got soul. I don't care what your color is. I think music needs to be something that helps us to, to know what we all have in common. How music can save your life. Find it wherever you listen to podcasts. Well, we're, we're, I think it really invites this question. You, you, you write quite a lot about empathy, a topic about mm. which I am very invested and, and, and agree. And I was one, I mean, I was wondering what, what you think of the state of empathy in businesses these days. Do you feel like it's on the rise? It's stabilized? It's dec declining? And, and then to your book, which is so much about tech, what is the role of tech in empathy these days? Is it positive, like your outlook on the internet in general? Um, it's mixed. <laughs> I think it generally ha tends to have an amplifying factor. So I think where empathy already exists, people will find ways to have empathy and develop that empathy in their relationships at work or in their personal life. I think where it doesn't exist, it's probably an easier shortcut to not having to worry about it. So I, I don't know if it's fundamentally changing anyone's empathy, but I have a feeling it's probably amplifying either the empathy that's already there or the lack of it. Now, the other thing about empathy and tech is I think it takes a lot more deliberate work to understand people and connect with people online. And it's relatively easy to assign tasks and to check off checklists and to do things virtually without ever having any sort of connection or empathy with other people. So I think it really takes extra time and deliberate effort to develop processes and communication tools and activities or events or whatever they are to make sure that you can connect with each other digitally um, and have that time. And I think the other thing about kind of digital tech and tools is often it's highly structured. And I think it's also good to have unstructured time for discussions, for communications, for chit chat, sometimes for just getting to know people that wouldn't always get fit into a schedule, especially because people are busy. So if you're taking away that physical proximity, that often leads to more unstructured time, more communication that doesn't necessarily have a purpose. If you're taking a lot of that away, you need to find a replacement for that. Um, and it's hard to do, and it's especially hard to do if not everyone has the same level of kind of comfort and experience with tech and uses those communication tools in the same way, because then you really, really have to make that effort to find common ground. So 
yeah, I, I don't know if it's fundamentally changing things, but I think it could. And as anyone who works in a team or leads a team, we really, really need to make that effort to make sure we're not losing empathy in the workplace. Um, but what do you think about that? Do you think tech is changing how you see communication with other people with empathy? Oh, and development yeah, of it? Absolutely. I mean, to your point, I think that you do need to be deliberate. And I feel like the shortcuts that tech are providing convenience, speed, free. We, we have created ecosystems that the algorithms are promoting. So we're not getting diversity of inputs to help us to better understand. I think that to your idea of social, dark social or, or things that are not being seen, um, we're so worried about things that we're putting online and the type of image that we're portraying which isn't necessarily a true one, and therefore not being empathic with yourself, much less with other people. So we're projecting and putting on all sorts of masks and masquerading COVID notwithstanding around different types of personalities. And so when you talk about your group dynamics and getting to know each other, there's some who are good on the web, some are not, some are maybe introverts, some extrovert, different personalities, different diversity of, of, of realities. We're, we're not so good at that. And um, I even feel like the biggest problem is that we, we still don't do the work. You mentioned this aha moment, you sort of get to know who you are. But I feel like so many people rather stick to the mask than the hard work of getting to know you, yourself. And if you don't know yourself, you're not going to be aware of the things that trigger you and or baggage that you're carrying along into a relationship with a, a colleague or somebody if we're just sticking to the work area but it's also true in personal life and therefore uh we are we're, we're pretty crap at at having group dynamics online we don't know ourselves and we don't make that deliberate effort to get to know each one differently uh we, without big generalizations and and a, a need to brushstroke quickly because time is of the essence. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's tough to do too, especially when you talk about knowing yourself. It's not just the time to right? It's tough because you're naturally, the, the deeper you dig, the more stuff you're going to find that you don't necessarily like or you're not comfortable with. Indeed. So there's hurdles there too, because there's always stuff then that you have to overcome and you have to deal with um, and, or some things that you have to confront or you know, how you have to manage that before you can even do that in other people. And I think you have to be able to understand that about yourself before you can have that really full and deep empathy for other people, you know, because once you reflect sometimes on things you've done, or I can use myself, like things that I've done in the past that were a mistake or things that I do, wouldn't want to do again, or relationships that I would not ever want to play out in the same way. I think you have to be able to see that in yourself to be able to see the mistakes that other people make as forgivable, right? And you can say, okay, I can understand why that person is so stressed or in such a difficult situation right now or why they're reacting like this or a place that that might come from but you have to be able to forgive yourself for mistakes if you're going to be able to forgive other people for them too i think that's a really fascinating point and i i mean i think for myself i've always had trouble with forgiveness and so within my evaluation of myself i i try to be aware of that i i'm probably also with the ego uh, sometimes more likely to brush over the mistakes I've made or try to repolish them and position them differently. Whereas the first time I ever cried in public in, in a work environment, uh, I thought it was just the end of the world had come nigh and this was the biggest embarrassment. But it turns out that by doing that, it, well, first of all, I got to tap into something about me that I hadn't sort of cottoned on to mm -hmm. before and my reaction and relationship with stress. And then in terms of the, the people's opinion of it, it, it absolutely transformed the way they looked at me. Some of them ran out the door saying, you know, God, don't want any of this. But others uh, were much more open to it and, and, and probably much stronger connected into it for having shown weakness, for having expressed mm -hmm. this imperfection. But I, I think that a, a, in, in our world today, especially those who've come from an older uh, group where we're still projecting images and, and not willing to accept these uh, imperfections. And therefore we end up with 
a fairly bad style of management and leadership. I mean, that's how I project the problems into or how, what I see happening in, in businesses, this lack of good leadership. What do you think? Yeah, and I think one of the things you raised there about role models and you know how what people use, who people use as role models or who people's kind of ideal images of what an ideal worker looks like. And I think that's sometimes the problem with a lot of people's role models being people that they've taken from public images of social media. Right. Right. Because those are not people, those are brands. I mean, there's <laughs> a person behind them and you know, there's real behavior and there's real emotions and they're real people. But a social media profile that is basically an advertising platform is a brand selling a lifestyle. And it's not necessarily a real person and it's not a fully deep, complex, fully developed role model necessarily. And it's not someone one that you can learn from emotionally because the emotions that they're putting on as part of a brand story, you know, are not necessarily something that you can pick up and have a genuine connection to in that same way. So I think that's a new problem that's emerging. You know, people have always used like you know, movie stars or you know, people right. figures as role models, politicians sometimes, but it's a different style of kind of role models that people are picking up from and thinking that they have to emulate both in kind of style and type of communication and type of working with people resolving conflict you know people look at social communications and connections and breakdowns and relationships online and use those as models sometimes um, which is causing a whole new set of problems and i think um, that can cause problems with empathy too right it's much better more effective to use fully develop people who you have relationships with and can have deeper conversations and connections with to understand how to manage conflict and communication and relationships than these kind of strange role models on, you know, in the digital world. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about always, by the way. I think that we sort of have to think about the modern era as to looking up to stars. Hmm. I think that the vast majority of people in terms of Maslow's pyramid, continue to be not worried about living as movie stars just yet. They're trying to get a bowl of rice on their plate, that kind of a feeling. Yeah. But one of the things I wanted to get into, because I love the fact that we're intergenerational, is a notion of appetite for effort and pain. Mm. And it's been my observation that society in general is trying to portray a more perfect image of each of us and whenever we can run away from pain and my the leap that i make and you as a psychologist can sort of dig in on this one is that we we'd rather avoid pain because that's an imperfection within me whether it's psychological or physical and and i feel like we're doing everything we can to to run away from that, to project to a perfect Instagrammable version of me, than to accept the fact that I I can suffer pain, and that I am mortal. Yeah. See, I don't know if people are fully running away from it. I think people are avoiding showing pain in public, uh, which I think is fundamentally different. But I think a lot of the stuff that happens and even a lot of the trends related to work are very much about pain. If you're looking at, you know, constant work, constantly on lifestyle and, you know, projecting this all of the time, probably a lot of that pain is just moved to the personal sphere, but none of it is being shown in public. Cause I think a lot of these things and these lifestyles that people are trying to lead are very, very difficult, especially if there's something that people think they should be doing, but it really doesn't align with what their, you know, kind of personality traits would. Their core <laughs> values their core values and their natural tendencies and their ways of behaving with other people. So I, I don't know if it's really being necessarily avoided, but I think people are really trying hard never to show it. I was listening to an interview uh, with Sam Harris on his podcast and the, uh, I can't remember the name of the individual who was talking about it, but the nature of online presenting these rich and famous lovely you know actors and actresses perfect bodies perfect lives we we tend to then aspire towards it without acknowledging the amount of effort that it takes to actually get to that position you know i want to be like that person but i'm not interested in doing the the work to get there whether or not that actually is, is true is another statement but the gap between the uh, result going back to your point at the beginning what i'm looking for my objective of success and the work that it takes to get to that success this is another element this lack of effort and i'm wondering what your take on that is 
Yeah, well, I, I, that's some of that is linked to personality too, because I think those kind of failures or inability to achieve that kind of desired outcome is incredibly painful um, for a lot of people, especially if it's continued um, failure or inability to achieve whatever those goals are, whether or not they're realistic. But I mean, you're right, there is a serious gap between the amount of work required to achieve any of these outcomes, whether it, you know, perfect body, perfect career, top rated career, whatever it is. And I think the other thing that people don't always realize is the amount of sacrifice in all other areas of your life that it takes to achieve that. Yeah. Right. Because the amount this idea of work balance, work life balance. I want yeah. to succeed everything and have work life balance. <laughs> yeah. I would have the perfect family. I want to have tons of free time. I want to go on holidays. I want to take loads of photos of them that are professionally retouched. And I want to have this career where I'm working 16 hours a week, but I don't want to look like I'm working 16 hours a week. And I mean, you can choose one at best, right? Or do a lot of things pretty well. <laughs> so again, that's that question of time management, because it's just not possible to do all of those things. You know, every hour, every day, you're making choices to do different things. And in some ways, you're making choices not to do other things, but you have to make those decisions. Um, and I think that can be incredibly difficult and paralyzing for people sometimes when they well, like you said, don't necessarily understand what their own priorities are. They don't have that self-understanding to go, okay, I don't care about that much, that, that much, or I don't care about that enough to spend my days and weeks and months on it. So figuring out which of those to prioritize is important because, you know, failing at one thing is tough, but if it's something that you want to do, sometimes that pain is worthwhile, but failing at everything all the time is paralyzing. Right. It brings up the point you mentioned earlier about not liking some things within us mm -hmm. and when someone points the finger at you including yourself i failed i didn't rise to the occasion that can be a painful thing in and of itself and i think it brings up this other point which you mentioned which is knowledge of success and if my bar is looking like uh beyonce or whatever that oh I miss you're just you're jumping on some bandwagon, someone others, someone else's version of success, and you're bound to fail. So yeah. it's important to have ambition, I think, to, to expect to suffer some pain to get to it. Otherwise, you're not you're just going to might as well sit still and do nothing. And yet not to strive for someone else's version of success, to find your own version. Yeah, and I think all of those kind of life story books, there's a whole genre of CEO books that do this too, right? You know, whether it's kind of Beyonce and entertainment or Steve Jobs or Jack Welch was popular for a while. I don't think yeah, he's a role sure. model anymore for a lot of people, but was for a long time. And then there, all of these biographies are spawned from that. And it says, here's step A, B, C, here's how they got there. And you're never going to be able to come even close to replicating that. You know, the same life conditions, the same family conditions, the same experience, learning the same lessons at the same time. There's a few useful lessons you can pick up from those, but you're never never going to be able to emulate that trajectory, that success in that way. Um, if you try to do that and try to emulate it, there's always going to be disappointments from that because it's just never going to work out. So you really have to kind of pick and choose a few lessons, a few points, goals, and keep them realistic and manageable for within your situation and your ambitions and your capabilities and the time you want to put into a certain thing. And then once you figure that out, then you can focus on it and really work towards that. But yeah, you're right. Trying to replicate anyone else's life is just going to be doomed to failure. Yeah, the key thing I'm retaining from what you're saying, Ian, is this notion of strategy. And, and mm -hmm. I really think that's the, the key point within your time management is being strategic about how you spend your time. But in, in order for that to happen, you need to know what the strategy is. Yeah. which in life's case is knowing who you want to be as an individual, as opposed to, you know, make $23 million or whatever it is. You, you write a lot about Trump, um, a fair amount anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to ask you, and again, this is sort of leaning on your psychologist side, is you, you explain a lot about how he got to that type of personality through his family and all that. My question is, where is the role of self-accountability? And at what point do you drop the the baggage or the 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 inheritance if you will 
uh, mm. which genealogical or others and say, well, shit, I am a shit and I need to move on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think for, well, that's a tough one too, because there's a couple things going on there. One of the reasons that I explain the trajectory in that is because I think I, there's not very much I can do for Donald Trump in developing his self-insight. And I don't think he's going to read my book. I hope he does, because there'd be very angry <laughs> reaction to that and it would be a boost for sales. But I don't think I'm going to make a difference there. But I think what is interesting and instructive from a life story like that is to see how that develops and how you know personality develops over the lifespan and how defense mechanisms build up and how you can see how when someone is rewarded for something continually through their entire life then they're going to continue with that behavior and when there's you know there's not a lot of consequences or there's someone else to clean up the mess and then the outcomes of that behavior tend to be useful for what that person wants to accomplish, then it tends to reinforce it. And I think everyone is going to work with someone like that, or probably more than one person like that in their careers, in their lives, they might know people like that in their personal life. So understanding where it comes from is sometimes useful for dealing with it. And sometimes understanding that it's something that you can't fix in another person necessarily. But if you can understand that this is a pattern of behavior that's been around for 40, 50, 60, years, then you need to manage how you relate to that or choose if you do or do not. Because um, I've talked to some people after this book actually have said, oh, I worked for someone like that. What can I do in that environment? And sometimes you can't, like sometimes you can't fix it. And especially if it's a manager, a boss, a CEO, it's not something or an environment that you can fundamentally change. You have to make that decision whether or not you want to be in that environment. So I think learning from those kind of trajectories is useful and instructive in that way. Um, and then the role is for self-awareness in ourselves is understanding who we want to work with, what kind of relationships we want to be managing and building, um, and how we're interacting with other people and doing that consciously and making decisions about it. Does that yeah, answer so, the question? Yeah, so like being deliberate again. Yeah. And having that self-awareness uh, on your own side and then um, looking at others and trying to understand better their situation, applying empathy to it. Um, <laughs> it's kind of an ironic situation in light of the personality about whom we were talking. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is not a, a political bashing session. Um, another area I wanted to talk about was hybrid work. Uh, mm. You discuss remote work and such in your book. And, and and oftentimes you're really sort of putting situations of work in light of disorders that we have. I'm wondering uh, how in general you think a, a, a company organization should approach hybrid work to make it successful. Is there a place for imposition within the flexibility that we seem to be encouraging? So in other words, should we be insisting on certain things, for example, show up on time for a video conference or yeah. come to the office on three days or are there th how do we make hybrid work work from your perspective and with whether or not you, you want to use disorders as part of the, the challenge or not, go for it. Yeah, no, that's a really good question because I think we're still kind of early into a massive experiment about whether remote and hybrid working can really work. The evidence shows that it is a massive boon for productivity for people who are who know what they're doing and are able to manage that autonomy and, and independence. So giving people that flexibility is a huge boon for productivity. Now, the interesting thing we're seeing is productivity is not necessarily the only thing. So sometimes productivity comes at the expense of individual well-being and health. So we really have to manage how we approach and structure remote or hybrid working to make sure that it's giving people the control to do the job that they know how to do well in their own time on their own schedule. But you're right, there are some impositions we have to make and there does still need to be structure around work. And I think the important thing there is performance management. So people absolutely need to know what the expectations are, what the tasks are and how they're being graded on success. You know, how they approach that might be an area for a lot of flexibility, whether they're, you know, working early in the morning, whether they wanna work a bit later, whether they have family obligations that they wanna fit into that, how they wanna do that. But things like being on time for meetings, absolutely. That should be a core requirement of, you know, any workplace. There may be certain activities or certain things that are more useful to do in person. 
Um, and like we talked about before with developing empathy and team building and collaboration, understanding other people, I think absolutely there's a huge role for doing that in shared spaces um, when it's possible and when it's realistic within organizations that may be global. But um, if it's possible to meet in person and have those unstructured conversations, to have that time to get to know other people on a more deep level than you might have on a 20 minute Zoom call, especially if there's 40 people on the call, is important. and. But it's also important and necessary to communicate the value of that and to tell people why they're doing it. Because if you tell people, yeah. we've got a two day session, you all have to show up here and do these activities and here's what you have to do. And we've got the time scheduled for you and you have to be here at this time and do this. this, this. That's good to try and make the effort, but you really also need to communicate why you're doing it, what the value is of it, what you're trying to get from it, maybe have people make their own goals related to who they want to meet, who they want to connect with, some ideas they want to come up with, or, you know, some outcomes that they have for that session or that, you know, that structured time as well. So again, being deliberate about it and making sure you have a really clear idea about the rationale for doing it. The other thing I don't want to encourage is being too arbitrary of saying, you know, everyone has to be at all of these meetings at this time every single day. Dogma. Um, Dogma, exactly. Um, because I think some of that goes with the surveillance point that I talk about in the book too. There's a rise of digital surveillance that I really don't like. Personally, I'm uncomfortable with it, but also the research shows it's completely counterproductive. People work much better if you give them autonomy. Whereas if you're monitoring people's screen time all of the time and analyzing their activity and saying, why did you spend two minutes on this program? And why did you switch at this time to do this activity and blah, blah, blah. Because that happens. People are monitoring and recording their employees' time and their cameras and sometimes biometrics all the time when they're at work. That doesn't work at all. And I think that's lazy and bad management. It's just micromanagement in the digital era. So making sure that people have a clear structure and framework is essential, but then flexibility within that is also really important. Yeah, you talk, uh, and it was something I wanted to pick up on, and you, you divide it into three, which is surveillance, oversight, and performance management. And I, I kind of took issue with your description of surveillance as being the definition of which was surveying everything all the time, everywhere, basically, okay, sort of like yeah. communism sort of thing. Whereas I, I, I mean, I think surveillance can be very targeted. Uh, mm. Just like oversight can be very targeted, but can also become very much over management, over overseeing every detail, and and then performance management. Well, it depends on the metrics you put down as success, and like you were saying, yes. you know, like qualifying. What do you mean by how you're going to assess somebody at the end of the year? What does success look like? These are are the objectives clear? One of the things I, I liked very much about what you said is is explaining the why. Why are we doing this as opposed to being dogmatic? In that explanation of why, first of all, I think it's very rarely done, like you say, but yeah. I also <laughs> think it's an explicit rendering of your culture. Mm. This is why we do these things. And, and uh, I think particularly problematic are onboarding. When you're in a large company and you want to bring some people new in, I think there needs to be some significant impositions in order for that implicit culture to be able to come through because just getting it through a screen it ain't happening you don't see my twidget you know fidgeting feet you don't see me you know looking down at my well you do but you, you it's not quite as obvious that i might be looking at another screen at the same time as i'm looking at you and all that kind of stuff whereas when you're in a in a room we are human beings and we need to be social not dark <laughs> when it comes to these things uh, any final remarks yeah, I mean, on that point, actually, I've recently had the experience of meeting people in person who I've worked with for a longer period of time in person, and all of a sudden, sometimes stuff makes sense. Or there was recently someone that I met that I didn't really get along with. I, I, don't, I didn't really understand them, actually. And then I met them in person, and I was like, okay, you're not an asshole. You're really shy. And I never really realized that online. Mm. Because, you know, sometimes when people have structured time and a screen and agenda and stuff, Back their to the approach to it is... Yeah, they've got their mask on and they don't have the same approach because if they're focused on a task, it's very different than their have that open ended conversation. And it was interesting for that because the kind of the situation in the physical shared space was a bit uncomfortable at first. But then I was like, OK, no, it all makes sense. Like you're not 
Um, it wasn't deliberately kind of mean or rude or anything. It was just their style of work. And it kind of fit with the, the job they did and it all made sense. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I get you now. And it was, it took five minutes when months and months and months of digital communication huh. didn't give that impression. So I think we do need to make room for that. And all of the great advantages of digital technology, we definitely should not throw away shared connection in shared physical spaces with people. So great insight. Um, it makes me also think about how just because you have an open space doesn't mean that people are open yeah. and, you know, open for business, open to chat. It feels like it's kind of the reverse, you know, in unintended consequences. Ian, our conversation must come to a close because time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for coming on. Great chatting with you and uh, fun sharing beforehand. Uh, your Canadianness and, and your work with uh, the Irish tech news and such. But um, even though you may not be a regular um, with notifications, how could people track you down, follow you? And of course, more, most importantly, get your book, Dark Social. Yeah, Dark Social is available at everywhere books are sold, all fine bookstores and hopefully the not fine ones too. Um, I'm on Twitter, Ian S. McRae. I'm on LinkedIn, Ian S. McRae. I've got a LinkedIn, or sorry, I've got a YouTube channel where I do some discussion videos, informational videos, lots of content related to the book. So if you like video content, uh, search for me on YouTube. And yeah, on the platforms I'm on, I'm very open to chatting. But <laughs> so feel free to get in touch. I love talking about these, um, all these topics. So thanks very much, Mentor. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Ian. Thanks for having listened to this episode of the Minter Dialogue podcast. If you like the show, and would like to support me, please consider a donation on patreon.com forward slash Minter Dial. You can also subscribe on your favorite podcast service. And as ever, rating and reviews are the real currency for podcasts. You'll find the show notes with over 2,000 and more blog posts on minterdial.com. Check out my documentary film and four books, including my last one, You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man.
Hi, I'm Brendan Slocum. I'm going to tell you how music can save your life, what it can do for you, and what it has done for me and my guests. It's such a universal language. You can go any place in the world, and I love that. Hey, if you got soul, you got soul. I don't care what your color is. I think music needs to be something that helps us to, to know what we all have in common. How music can save your life. Find it wherever you listen to podcasts.